please welcome Dr. Paul Grundy. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. And the topic of integration, um, when, when I think of the patient-centered medical home, I really think of it as the integrator, um, and we'll talk about that today, at the relationship level between the healer and, and the physician, and, and the patient, excuse me. Um, fr from my standpoint as a buyer of care, um, the, uh, th there's three terms that I think, think are helpful in understanding, uh, and they're probably global now, but I think of a provider in three categories. I, I think of them as a comprehensivist, so, somebody who is willing to deliver comprehensive care with a team of folks that, that, that in, encompasses the, the entire um, needs of the patients and being willing to integrate, coordinate, make that accessible uh, in a meaningful way. Um, in most countries, that, that's the primary care provider. In this country, that isn't entirely so. We had the rollout now of our third oncology medical home. Um, in in um, th this one I visited was in Pennsylvania last week, um, where you have a team of folks that are willing to be that comprehensivist, but have a focus on patients who have oncological uh, problems, but, but, but yet are still willing to make sure that the patients get their immunizations, they get their required follow-ups, th there's really, uh, there's really population management as part of that. You, you then have a partialist, you know, a folk that deal with a part of the body and don't want to be the comprehensivist, which, which are many of, of the folks that are specialists, but want to be the principal provider of care. And, and there's a number of folks that fit into that category, and I see that as I travel around the country. Um, and, <clears throat> and that's fine for me as a buyer, but I want them to still have a relationship with somebody who is willing to deliver comprehensive care. I'm going to make that free to my employees. I'm going to drive that. And then the third, uh, the third relationship you could have with a healer, um, from my standpoint, is the partialist who is the consultant, right, who, who, who delivers expertise, who wants to do that knee replacement, doesn't want to do comprehensive care. Um, and, and I guess in my worldview, I'm, I'm moving towards a, a mechanism in which all of my employees have a relationship with a comprehensivist, and there's adult supervision that occurs when they deal with the healthcare delivery system in other ways. So I had the privilege of visiting Denmark. I, one of my jobs, I'm the president of Acure, which is a technology under the Danish system. They've probably pushed the primary care element further than any other society. They say they learned that from reading our pediatric literature and looking at what Kaiser did. Um, but they've moved from 157 hospitals down to 21 in 15 years. Ambulatory sensitive care conditions are actually done in an ambulatory environment. It's a huge shift. In my last trip there, I was there with the CEO of Kaiser, Jack Cochran, the CEO of the, of the Permanente Federation and HAL and the leadership of Kaiser, and, and we were really in, we were really meeting one of the best integrated systems in the world, Kaiser, with, with one of the, I think, probably the best primary care delivery systems in the world, uh, the Danish uh, uh, system, and, and learning from each other's lessons. Um, it was quite interesting. But I was at a table my last day with the Minister of Health and some of the leadership in Denmark, and one of the docs at the table asked me this question that I want to start off this conversation with today. And that, the event in Tucson had just occurred where that congresswoman was shot. And that particular doctor said, who was the shooter's doctor? And, and, and I thought about that a lot. And in our society right now today, that's a very bizarre question. We don't really think about that. But, but it's absolutely normal absolutely natural question for the Danes to be asking. Who's responsible? Who's managing the population? And, and, and I was out at Edwards Air Force Base, and, and I had this same conversation with some of the sen senior officers there, and they have the same question of every one of their 
members. That's why the DOD has moved completely full-heartedly. Every single soldier will have a medical home because they can't afford not to know who a member's physician is and who's responsible, who's accountable, down to the individual population level. So, so if, if we're talking about the transformation, the, the terms that were just used um, by Dr. Lee Sachs, and, and we put them together and we think about what this really is about. What is this whole movement? What is this whole change about? Simply put, the change is about moving from episodes of care to moving to population management. That's the bottom up, right? The top down is moving away from fee for service as the mechanism to pay for that to other dials to begin to pay for that. In the Danish system, there are three major dials. Huh? We now have that in a number of states beginning to roll out. Vermont is one that we are the largest employer on. And, 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 and one third of the physician's salary in the community in Denmark is based on how well the health of the community does, right? One third is based, and for the primary care docs, one third is based on fee for service, and one third is based on how well they actually service the patient. So almost equivalent to the triple aim, right? But, but they actually pay for that rather than fee for service. So if we could roll that, uh, that video, um, if it's ready. This is, this is a few years old. This is one of my earliest talks that I did in Pennsylvania at a graduation class. And the medical students did a little parody of the conversation. It's called Outside Hospital. Last April, I developed a severe case of diarrhea with dehydration. The doctors at Outside Hospital recommended a cardiac catheterization just to be safe. Even though they eventually diagnosed me with a virus as the cause of my symptoms instead of a heart attack, it's so important to have the peace of mind knowing that I don't have any major artery blockages, especially now that I'm on dialysis. When you come to Outside Hospital, we're not just going to focus on your actual complaints. We're not going to be constrained by formal indications for procedures. If you have chest pain, we can cath you. If you have a cough, we can cath you. If your left knee hurts, we can cath you. When I came into outside hospital with a urinary tract infection, I guess I was a little preoccupied. I forgot to mention that I had a mole removed when I was a kid. Fortunately, their computers picked up on it right away, and they had a dermatology consult there within minutes. We are going to bring all of our resources to bear so that Gotta you get the, the most out of your hospital stay. If you have diabetes, we can consult an endocrinologist. If you have lungs, we can consult a pulmonologist. <laughs> we can consult any specialist to see you for any organ you have for which we have a specialist. When Ethel came down with cough, shortness of breath, and high fevers, I knew it was time to get her to outside hospital right away. The doctors at outside hospital emergency room realized my heart was beating very fast and I'd stopped making urine. Luckily, they knew just what to do. They immediately gave me a large dose of Lasix and some metoprolol. Eventually, when they realized my symptoms were due to septic shock from a pneumonia, they were able to get an IV in my hand and get me to the University of Pennsylvania Hospital right away. At outside hospital, we're used to working with tertiary care centers. We know how to make these transfers run smoothly. We're not going to overburden the doctors there with meaningless copies of cath reports, echoes, a transfer summary. We send only what's important, a big stack of nursing notes. <laughs> That's what we do. So I showed this. Um, to the Association of American Medical Colleges about two months ago in Pennsylvania. I don't know if anybody was there. It was the, some of the leadership of uh, the hospital systems. And, and the, the guy from Harvard, a lady actually from Harvard, said, you know, sarcasm is a wonderful way of, of expressing the point. And I said, who's being sarcastic? <laughs> and then I said, you know, what happens to you guys? 
when you continue to produce a product, we don't want to buy anymore. We can't afford to buy anymore, and we don't want to buy anymore. I mean, we are literally, as buyers of care, sitting at tables all over the country right now, trying to figure out how to write you out of our benefit plan. Believe me, we're doing that. You know, we, we really want you to move to comprehensive, integrated, coordinated care, and we want you to move away from episodes of care. We want you to think very differently about the care you deliver us because, you know, we're simply not going to be buying from you anymore. You should listen because I'm the buyer, right? I have never seen so many crossed arms in my life. It was an interesting conversation. So, Don uh, Fisher and I have had this conversation now going on for, for years. Uh, four years ago, I think almost five years ago, we met at a restaurant in Alexander, Virginia, talking about PCMH and ACO and the journey uh, of what this means and what it is. My view is we're talking about the same thing, clinical integration. We're really talking about the same coin. It's just viewed from a different perspective. From my perspective as a buyer of care, it's about care that's accessible, that's integrated, that's coordinated, that's available, you know, in a healing relationship from the bottom up, from the top down, there's accountability that's structured, how it's paid for, you know, by bundles, shared savings, et cetera. But the same view, um, I mean, the, sa the same concept, the same coin, just, just a different view. Um, this week, uh, I always like to start off with, 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 with rapid changes that, that are occurring. Um, this week, the Kelsey Sebo Clinic uh, announced that it received its NCQA level three recognition. We, we now have 42,000 physicians that are NCQA or equivalent certified across the United States. There's, there's many places where it's further ahead than others. Next door in Michigan, about half of the primary care physicians are on the track for that. And, and in Maryland, we have a little over half. Um, the highest concentration is in Rhode Island, but you know, it's, it's, it's moving very, very rapidly. It's quite interesting because in this conversation four years ago that Don Fisher and I had about patient-centered medical home, about the concept of that, Don said the Kelsey Sebo Clinic would never want to do that, and I see that they're certified here uh, last week. Um, we, we came out with the first, with the second year of data for uh, the, the uh, CDPHP, and I'm going to share with, that with you in a minute, but it's very positive. We now have about 100 sets of data, a little bit more from around the country, with very consistent and very positive results. The state of Kansas is now, I think, the 37th state or, or, or close to that, where they've really embraced the concept from the state level. Um, Medicaid is driving it in the state. The state of Kansas has passed a law saying that all of their employees will have medical home. And we see the rollout this week um, of uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield um, and the Kansas Academy of Family Physicians, the Kansas Medical Society, et cetera, rolling out PCMH across the state. Again, announced in the newspaper um, yesterday or day before. Um, th this is the data that, that's out from uh, CDPHP. Um, and we have a significant employee base. This is in the Hudson Valley. This is uh, from Albany up and down. Some of the folks from New York are, are, are in this catchment region here today. Um, but this is the kind of data, and this is the consistent data we're seeing across the spectrum. And why wouldn't I want to buy this as a buyer of care? Why wouldn't I want to buy this? You're seeing the same kind of journey we saw in Denmark, right? We're seeing better upstream care, better management of care, better indication of care, resulting in lower downstream costs. Ambulatory sensitive conditions, they can actually be treated in the ambulatory environment. Um, this is another announcement um, uh, from yesterday or, or, or thereabouts. This is, this is, this is uh, the Portland, Oregon area banging up against Southwest Washington um, with all the major systems declaring that their future is based on patient-centered medical home. And again, this is, this is rolling out some states faster than others. But, but pretty rapidly. And, and there's a reason for that, and the reason for that is my RFP, if you read my RFP, if you read the RFP from Dow, if you read the RFP from GE, if you read the RFP from OPM going out against the healthcare plans, you, you, you know, you, you would be moving in this direction because we don't want to buy episode-based care, 
anymore. Um, this is the reason why. There are three trends that are driving this. This is just one of those three trends. This is the cost trend. The cost trend we're on is not sustainable. From the standpoint of the large employers, this is no longer a benefits issue. This is a cost issue. We move jobs. We move jobs to places where healthcare is a better value proposition. And where we move those jobs to is where there's robust base of primary care, where there's some adult supervision over the delivery of specialty care. You know, the grand junctions of the world that you read about in the Atul Gawande article. So, you know, a after that talk in 19, um, in 2008, um, in which the, you saw the 2007, I guess it was, you saw the kids do the parody of it. One of the first things I did was approach my marketing folks um, and ask them how much it would cost to support the New Yorker for a tool to do article. One million dollars um, a year we spend, um, you know, in supporting the New Yorker articles. We think they're an elegant storytelling of the journey that we're on and the kind of care we want to buy. Um, we, we probably did, did lots of harm to our colleague Gene here in, from Grand Junction by being overrun by questions. But, but a fascinating story of a system that actually delivers a better value proposition. So the other trends um, that, that, that are driving this is data. For the very first time in history, we have data. And it's going to do for the doctor's minds. It's going to do for our ability to understand what's going on in the system, what x-rays done for vision, right? It's just opening up. I mean, I can tell you exactly how much it costs per day for my employees when they go to Eisenhower Hospital in Palm Springs. I know. And with that data, we move jobs. So I had the privilege of visiting a large academic center on the East Coast probably two years ago now, but I, but I keep repeating this story because I think it's, a, it's an interesting story. And as I drove to that hospital, there was a big, you know, there was a big sign, um, you know, on the, on the street and it said, you know, we do the best oncology in this state. Nobody does better oncology than we do. You know, we just do the, the fan. I went into that hospital and I said, that's not the kind of sign I want to see. I want to see the sign that says, we do the most comprehensive integrated coordinated care. We do it so well that, you know, you're going to experience one-third less necessity to have heart surgery, you're going to experience, you know, a, a population that's managed and they're screened for their, for their oncological needs and, and they're prevented whenever possible. And then we do the best oncology and then we do the best heart surgery. I, mean, I know exactly what that sign says. That sign says we know where the money is and we're going after it. I know exactly what it says. And you're not ever going to get another job in this community. Not ever. It isn't going to happen. In fact, we're moving our jobs out of this community, and we're doing it right now. And other employers are going to follow. This is a cost issue for us. Listen to the jobs. Listen to the sucking sound. It's the jobs, right? And that's the same message I gave the governor of that state. It's a cost issue. It's no longer a benefits issue. The big network... It's over. Tighter networks, it's coming. Um, that particular community, if somebody is unlucky enough to die before 65, right, it's the same in South Florida, the same in other high cost areas. It's on my bill, right? $168,000. Other places as low as $17,000, and in this, the slide I show you further on down, we actually have a 19% lower mortality in the places that's $19,000. This is a, in uh, health affairs, this was a bit tongue in cheek. It was in, I think, yesterday or today's issue. A and this is, this is about identifying the super utilizers like they do in Grand Junction, Colorado. Pay them to go away. 
it would develop uh, the multiplier effect, it, it, you know, the fallowship opportunities, make them go fallow, right? Fascinating. It's an interesting article. It's in, it's in uh, the current issue, uh, uh, in fact, just out today in, in Health Affairs. Uh, and and it, it may sound a little tongue-in-cheek, but I thought about that, and I thought that's exactly what we're doing as a buyer of care. That's exactly what we're doing as a large employer. We're identifying the super utilizers, and we're keeping our jobs away from those communities. And that's a, that's a pretty rough knife to use, right? I would much rather identify the super utilizers and have the community keep them from being super utilizers and turning my body parts and my patients into ATM machines like, like in the Atul Gawande article. Um, so we've arrived at a point where we probably have some of the best specialty care in the world. You know, we, we, we have the king of Saudi Arabia coming here for his back surgery. We have the Yakuza from Japan to come and get their kidney transplants. You know, we, we've really reached a point where we, where at least up until 10 years ago, I don't think anybody was, was as good as us. I don't necessarily think that's the case any, anymore. In fact, we now have 39 billion outflow from medical tourism, whereas six years ago we had 19 billion in, right? We, we are actually we are actually having more patients go to Apollo, Bomrengrad, and, and, and Singapore for their care outside the United States than, we, than we're attracting in, and that's only a recent phenomenon. But, but it's kind of like the Olympics a few years ago where we took the best basketball players in the world, we put them on a court, and they got whooped by the Albanians. Remember that? Even though we had the best players in the world, they didn't know how to team, they couldn't integrate, they couldn't pass the ball, they didn't, you know, I mean, that's what I don't want to buy anymore. I, I really don't want my folks going into a system in which there isn't comprehensive care at the base of it, there isn't robust primary care uh, at the base of it. Does that make sense to everybody? I think I'm probably preaching to the saved here uh, in my message. So this is where we're at. Um, we just had some data that came out um, within the last week or so saying that for the first time our life expectancy is now declining in the United States uh, compared to the other developed economies. Um, you know, this is my lifetime uh, in, in medicine and, and we've gone from being last to being dead last at, at, at twice the price of any other nation on the face of the earth. In, in an indicator that's probably the best indicator of how well the delivery system works and that is the 15 years from 40 on and the mortality in that 15 year window, right? So, so that isn't just a cost issue for me. That's a productivity issue. You know, when twice as many as my managers die off in this economy versus other economies, you know, that's a productivity issue for me. And that's what's happened to us. And that's, this article says, that that mainly is based on unre unregulated fee-for-service and over-reliance on rescue specialty care. We, we have just gotten really good at rescue specialty care and we failed to have a foundation of primary care. So about six years ago, maybe seven years ago now, um, we decided we wanted to change the covenant between the buyer and the provider of care as a large employer. We gathered 47 other large employers and TRICARE in the room um, of the Fortune 100. And, and we, we then asked all of the healthcare plans to join us uh, in a conversation about a year later. And, and we decided that we wanted to build as foundational a long-term comprehensive relationship as the base of a delivery system. And we wanted to change the covenant between those who should be providing that, i.e. primary care and the buyers of care. Um, out of that was born the Joint Principles of the Patient Center Medical Home. It's kind of a geeky name, but, but, but it goes back to the medical literature. Um, the AAFP had done something called a Future Family Medicine. Uh, the ACP had done the Advanced uh, Medical Home. The pediatricians had been doing medical home since 1967. And we, the buyers of care, asked the House of Primary Care to give us a set of principles upon which we could change the covenant between the provider and the buyer. That became the joint principles. That's now the standard of care in the DOD. It's the standard of care in the VA. And you see how rapidly it's moving across the landscape. Um, and when we went to the White House, 
um, Nancy Ann and Bob Kocher were there, and Nancy Ann said, you know, we like the concept. We, we, we really want to build that into to what we're doing. This was very early on in the administration. But we don't like the name medical home because medical home equals nursing home equals soil and green. And that was a bit, bit of the advice Don Fisher gave me earlier, equals soil and green tablets, if you remember the movie, anybody old enough. And, you know, that, that, that medical home plays well, plays very well in the... Uh, in the pediatric uh, arena, but not so well in the geriatric arena because it's that, that sort of interface. So, so, so Nancy Ann said, you know, we, we want to call it high touch primary care. And, uh, and I said, well, high touch was the name of the escort agency that our governor got caught using two weeks ago. <laughs> so, so, so it actually got rolled out as, as the Medicare Advanced Primary Care Initiative. Uh, the pilots are going to be rolling out in eight states here. Uh, and, and, and two weeks ago, they announced the, the, the rollout of the federally qualified clinics, medical home element of that, to 500 um, uh, FC, FQCs. Um, and, and there's quite a bit of money uh, coming down that path. Um, and then they did the announcement. It was pretty interesting because they said, you know, we're announcing the Medicare Advanced Primary Care. And then the next sentence was, this is our term for patient-centered medical home. That has been called that ever since. But, but it's in... It's, the language is in the law, and so, I mean, Kaiser has a good name for it. They call it complete care. Um, Geisinger calls it my patient navigator. Uh, I mean, I think there's just different ways of marketing it uh, and perhaps, you know, against the principles. But, but it's really, really powerful. It's really, really powerful because it's the first time we've had the buyers agree with all of organized primary care. It's endorsed by everybody. It, it's now become the standard of care, by the way, in the UK um, and, and throughout the European Union. Uh, as well. Taiwan is, is talking. I've, I, I'm going to New Zealand on, in next week. Uh, so there's a lot of global interest around it as well. Um, but, but basically, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about a system integrator. We're talking about a place, a team of, uh, of folks who, who face the patient uh, comprehensively and provide the platform upon which you can launch your weapon systems, your vertical weapon system. So if oncology is a powerful vertical weapon system and you have no platform to launch it from, if, if heart surgery is a powerful vertical weapon system and you don't have the integrator, you don't have the place where it can all come together, data can be made accountable, actionable and accountable, you know, th th then you, you don't have command and control, right? So that's all we're talking about. That's the simple concept. Let's create a place for command and control. Um, this is the view from the White House. Um, uh, this this is, is about three years old now. And, and you can see this being played out. This was prior to the ACA uh, being passed. Um, but, but you can see the language. You can see it still uh, working out. Um, this came out of the round table back in, um, in, in August of 2009. Um, this is, this is um, um, the, the gentleman's slide who uh, had too many free limo rides and didn't become our, our secretary of HHS. Um, but, but basically, uh, th this is the, the, the conversation uh, that we're having around rewriting of the pyramid uh, with a stronger base of primary care, comprehensive care, um, and, and moving away from spending all of our money on tertiary care and then leaving what's left over uh, for primary care. The, the uh, Canadian uh, government, um, the Minister of Health, when that slide came out that I showed you earlier uh, about us being last, the Canadians said, you know, we beat out the Yanks again, but we're next to last. And, and you know, we, we shouldn't be proud of, of what we've accomplished because everybody knows that a delivery system of value is a delivery system that has a robust base of primary care, and the Yanks, they don't have one. For us to beat the Yanks is kind of like beating a, a the, the, literally, this is the quote, it, you know, is, is like beating a team of midgets in basketball. I, I had the slide of that, but my, they made me stop sh showing it because, be, because they thought it was uh, unfair to the midgets. Um, this is what we're talking about. This is, this is the DOD view of this. This is uh, also uh, a TransferMed's uh, basic view. We're talking about a care that's team-based, 
We're talking about population health. We're talking about care that's centered on the patient's needs. We're really talking about refocusing training, and there's a huge amount of work going on in that arena. Um, we're talking about uh, very powerful clinical decision support, i.e., what we're trying to develop in Watson is part of that uh, conversation. We're talking about profound access to care. And I have stories about all of these. Um, but, but every one of these really changes the equation. Um, in Vermont now, I, I now have almost all of my employees in a medical home. They've gone from having 26% of the time access to their primary care provider to basically 100% access. Um, I, I've seen a 32% decrease in face-to-face -face visits, and I've seen a marked increase in asynchronous visits. You know, my patients love it when they can ask their doctor via email, via secure portal, about their lab test results, and they don't have to take half a day off to go and do that. It's really changing the equation. That, that's the third trend. So we talked about cost. We talked about data. The third trend that's driving this is that my kids, who are in their mid to late 20s, your kids, they are going to want to encounter the healthcare system very, very differently than we do. They don't understand why they can't encounter it the same way they encounter their bank, they encounter retail. They're going to want to have a very different experience. They're demanding that. They're demanding that of me when I buy care for my employees. My employees uh, you know, are demanding that. And where that's being delivered, those systems are really, really growing. I mean, Group Health in Seattle, I mean, they've undercut their competitors by 17% in that market in, in, in 18 months. I mean, why would I not buy care from them? And I am. I mean, that's why you saw that conversation happening uh, in southwestern, in, 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 the, in the southern part of Washington and Portland, Oregon. I mean, that's why you saw the, the largest group in Spokane, you know, sell to group health in Seattle. And we're, we're seeing that, that dynamics uh, happening all over. Um, this is the uh, bang up um, from the uh, Office of Personnel Management. I, I was privileged to do a keynote for them. This is publicly available. It's out on their websites. It's the carrier letter. This is the demand. This is the demand from, um, fr from a, a $39 billion book of business. Um, the, the folks who are employees of the federal government um, and, and this is really important because these are the guys that are going to run the federal exchange in 2014, right? So they're, use, they're using their employee base to drive this transformation. This same language is in my RFP. The same language is in Dow's RFP. This is the conversation we're having uh, with our healthcare care plans. Um, this, is the, this is sort of a, a no-brainer for us. This is the kind of data that we're seeing consistently. It's very consistent with this CDPHP data that you just saw. You know, we're seeing a marked drop in hospital days when you have better upstream care. We're seeing re hospital admissions markedly go down. We're seeing a drop in unnecessary hospital ER use. We're seeing unnecessary specialty care, ancillary care, all down, right? It's, it's the Grand Junction, Colorado story. It's different dials beginning to pay for these kind of outcomes and, and no longer fee for service. So read the, patient, read the, read the partnership for patient, right? That, that, that uh, rollout that, that I was part of in HHS. And, and you'll see that 11% of payment is moving away from fee for service to what? To preventing rehospitalization, to preventing bad things happening when you're in the hospital. So all of a sudden, there's a different dial, and it's no longer fee for service. Blue Cross Blue Shield, WellPoint, rolled out an announcement that said, you know, we're not going to increase any more fee-for-service. We're going to pay differently. We're going to pay for these 58 parameters, which are very similar to, to, to the partnership for patient. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Hawaii said to the providers in Hawaii, no more uptick in fee-for-service. We're going to pay you 14.8% more if you deliver NCQA level 3 or if you integrate with somebody who's doing that, but no more increase in fee-for-service, right? So you're going to see different dials. Um, I think the community that's probably furthest along, again, I, I, we, we happen to be the largest employer there, uh, corporate employer anyway. We've been working on this for almost six years, is, is Vermont. 
Um, we, we have most of our employees now in the medical home. We, we have an 11% downtrend in cost there for our employees. That's bending the curve. That's bending the curve. And it's really an interesting community in, in that we have taxed ourselves 1.9 cents for every sick care dollar. We take that sick care dollar, we've that money, we've created a community care team. We've put them right into the primary care practices. And those guys integrate health and sick care. So when you have four diabetics that are identified in a practice, those diabetics are taken to the beginning of the hiking trail, the hiking trail that that community has built on that 1.9 cents, and you begin to integrate health and sick care, and we see the number of risk factors that our employees have begin to decline, right? We see good prevention. We, we see the opposite of that sign that says we do the best oncology in the state, right? So, um, so you know, those are places we're looking for to put our jobs, right? But this is a really, a really good integrated model. It's well worth looking at. It's called the Blueprint for Health. Um, Craig Jones, and maybe one of these times you can come and have him speak to you. It's, it's a fascinating journey uh, we've worked on through both Republican and Democratic administrations, and, uh, and we're continuing to do that. Uh, this is the trend line. Uh, this is not political. Um, we have broad bipartisan support. I have, a, I have a, a videotape, I'll be glad to share it with anybody, with Newt Gingrich swearing on a stack of Bibles that patients at our medical homes, the best thing since sliced bread. And, you know, everybody believes Newt except for his first two wives, but that's another story. <laughs> um, again, this is moving, uh, a, you know, towards population management and away from fee-for-service. You're seeing other dials begin to, be, begin to ratchet. And we had the Minister of Health from the UK that came and talked to us about two years ago at a meeting in Harvard. And he said, you know, it's hard for us not to feel just a little bit superior to you, Yanks, because at least we have more than one dial. If you only have fee-for-service, or if you only have capitation, that's the only dial you have, you're going to get the results. You're going to get too much service or too little service. If you have multiple dials, you know, you, know, you can attune for that. Um, so these are some of the, these are some of the payment uh, mechanisms that we see uh, rolling out across the country. There are now, I think at last count, 107 of them that I'm aware of. There's probably more. Um, you guys probably all have examples uh, of them. Um, but, but, you know, in, in Minnesota, for example, if you're taking care of, of a patient that has that is, is got complex problems, you, you can earn as much as $60, $60 and some cents a month uh, for delivering NCQA level care. That's a significant amount of money. Uh, we, we, we've seen huge changes um, around that, again, in multiple dials. Um, this is... Uh, uh, some data that just came out again in June, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of, of Michigan, uh, a relatively new data. They're one of the states that's perhaps furthest along, but by, but by June of 2011, um, you know, they're, they're, they're counting about 11,000 uh, physicians that, that are in this migra migration to uh, PCMH uh, level care. Uh, and this would be consistent with data in, in Maryland and, and a few other states. Again, uh, this is the CDPHP data. Um, again, changing the mechanism of payment away from the dials. Um, workforce training. Um, there's a lot of work going on this. I was part of the Macy Foundation meeting. We had 11 academic medical centers. We had all the, the, the federal uh, agencies, the head of the Indian Health Service, the head of HHS, the head of, uh, of the VA uh, in this meeting. We spent three days. It was a camp meeting type, type of encounter. And uh, we went around the room saying, this is the kind of workforce we're going to need because we're going to need team-based, we're going to need coordinated care, we're going to need integrated care, we need, we need the process of training these kids very differently. I was out at uh, University of Oklahoma at Tulsa, and uh, th they're the first academic medical center that's used this model for the entire education and training base, their entire curriculum. A and my first, my encounter with them was their first uh, introduction to clinical medicine class. And instead of having four students in medicine count, encountering a patient about getting that chief complaint, there was a nursing student, a pharmacy student, a behavioralist, and a physician that were all in a team beginning to encounter from day one of their delivery system a team-based model of care, right? That's the future. And Herb Cohen from, from Columbia Presbyterian said, 
well, I don't know if we want to do this. I, I just don't know. I mean, you know, we, we like doing head transplant research. You know, we, we really, you know, like high-end academic research and primary care. I, I don't know if we want to do this. And, and, and the head of the VA said, this is not a conversation. We're not asking you what you want to do. We're telling you this is the workforce. Every VA member will have a medical home. And, and the workforce we need to deliver that is going to be team-based. It's no longer going to be a cowboy on a horse, you know, doing specialty care without a team. You know, and if you don't deliver that, you know, the guy from NIH spoke up and said, we're going to cut your grants starting about 2013 10% for academic medical centers that don't have a curriculum around this. So we're not having a conversation. This is the workforce we need. The DOD just told you, the VA just told you, the large employers just told you, this is what we want delivered and you're gonna have to deliver the workforce to do that. And you can read the Macy Foundation report. Um, it's, it's out there uh, on the website. So uh, I think with that, um, I'm gonna uh, wrap this up and leave some time for uh, questions uh, later on, and I hope you have some nice tough ones for me because I really enjoy that. Thank you very much.